I'm Cole Vincent Anderson, class of 2017. I'm majoring in industrial systems engineering. Cole is a very kind human being. He's always been very caring about others and makes his friends his brothers. I mean, he cares about them. Cole is a team player. He's a team guy. He loves being a part of things. In his sense of belonging, he seems to bring people together, sometimes in surprising, diverse, and different circumstances. He came into A&M a pretty good student, but with the rigors of the engineering curriculum, I mean, it's really forced him to dig a little deeper and really try to stretch. The combination of athletics and academics was very difficult adjusting for that from high school. And so after my freshman year, I realized that I really didn't achieve at the level that I wanted to at either. It wasn't necessarily about working harder, it's about working smarter. You have to fall in love with the process because you will really be out there working very hard. And then your hard work might not always get reflected immediately, but it will eventually. Cole is courageous in that whatever obstacles he's presented with, he collects himself and he approaches it actively with a plan with his training, and with a mindful pursuit forward. Immediately after college, I would really like to attend law school, and with my law degree, I'll be able to write my own ticket. Cole just likes to learn, and he's very energetic, and learned that you have to see beyond what you can see. You can do anything, but you can do it better. And I believe now, since he's been at A&M, he really has a lot of potential that he's just beginning to realize. When I think the Aggie spirit, I just think of the core values, excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, selfless service. Those are all things that I hold very close to my heart. And that's yet another reason why I think A&M is a school for me. Howdy. Howdy. First off, I want to thank um, Brian Wright and Chris Cummings for the outstanding video. They make me look really good on there, and that's not always easy, so they did a great job with that. Welcome to the Arthur E. Martell Lecture Hall for the State of University Address. I'm Cole Anderson, a proud member of the Fighting Texas Aggie class of 2017. As a college freshman, I could never have imagined that four years later, I'll be standing here before you today. Administrators, deans, faculty, and staff to introduce Mr. Michael K. Young, the 25th president of Texas A&M University. It is almost surreal to be selected for such a huge honor and privilege, and I'm delighted to be here representing my fellow Aggies. I'm so proud to have the support of my friends and family here with me this afternoon, my supportive girlfriend, Lydia Williams, my beautiful and strong mother, Charla Anderson, and my wise and dynamic father, Vincent Anderson. I am the person I am today because of their unconditional love, support, wisdom, encouragement, and solid values. I'm also grateful for my Texas A&M family, who has taught me so much and played such an important role in my life. During my time as a student, I have met and learned from so many wonderful people, my professors, coaches, advisors, etc., all role models who have helped me shape my academic career and helped me prepare for my future. As an aspiring law student, I was beyond excited to have the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with President Young. He is highly regarded as one of the best legal experts in the entire country, and he is an outstanding leader. It has been a highlight of my time here at Texas A&M, and I'm proud that he is serving as the president of our great university. Prior to arriving at Texas A&M last May, he was president and tenured professor of law at the University of Washington, and then prior to that, president and distinguished professor of law at the University of Utah. Before assuming the presidency at Utah, he was dean and professor at George Washington University Law School, a professor at Columbia University for more than 20 years, and a visiting professor and scholar at three separate universities in Japan. President Young graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School and has enjoyed broad experience across legal, public service, and diplomatic arenas. He served as a law clerk to the late Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist of the US Supreme Court and has held a number of high-ranking government positions. He's a strong leader in all areas, equally comfortable with students, faculty, and staff, as well as with international dignitaries and members of the Aggie Network that circle the globe. I'm inspired by his love and understanding of what makes Texas A&M great, and I look forward to spending more time with President Young. You should anticipate a dynamic presentation today as he shares his vision for the future of our beloved Texas A&M University. Please join me in welcoming President Michael K. Young.
Cole, thank you for that great introduction. And thank you for how you so honorably represent yourself as well as our students today and every day. We're also delighted your parents are with us today and we know they're as proud of you as we are. So welcome, thank you. Colleagues, I'm happy to be with you today on the 140th anniversary of this university. 140 years since the birth of this great university. We're meeting here today, broadcasting to colleagues as well at other campuses from the Arthur E. Martell Lecture Hall in the Chemistry Building here on our College Station campus. Dr. Martell, for whom this room was named, joined Texas A&M in 1966, became head of the Department of Chemistry for many years and retired in 2001. He's credited for significant advances in the field of inorganic chemistry. He also subscure, uh, secured substantial research grants, built remarkably collaborative teams, and quadrupled the size of the chemistry department, making it one of the finest in the country, a distinction it holds to this day. After retiring in 2001, he continued to come to his lab several days a week. Now, I thought it important to give this speech here in an academic building on campus, both as a reminder of our commitment to the continued pursuit of excellence in learning and discovery, uh, as well as a remarkable recognition of those of you who have followed your own calling to either teach or as administrators and staff to support our world-class educational environment. So we are here today in the Martell Lecture Hall. Now, colleagues, the state of the university is great 140 years on. By the way, I see we have lots of scholars here. Does anyone know what you call 140th anniversary? Now, 100s is easy, centennial, right? 125 is a bit more of a tongue twister. It's quasi-cree-centennial. Uh, 150, sesquicentennial, you can say it, hardly say it and hardly spell it. But 140 years, who celebrates 140 years? Well, as it turns out, we do today. And there is a word for it. It's quadrisquicentennial. <laughs> That's just to show you that four years of college Latin wasn't entirely wasted. <laughs> and it's a wonderful day for our university. I look forward to toasting you later today and toasting our beloved school and the faculty, administrators, staff, current and former students who together make up the Aggie network that's some 500,000 strong. The state of the university is great. Our student body is more diverse than it has ever been, 66,000 strong. Research funding surpassed $866 million last year, spurred on by many of you and the hard work you do, enhanced by the Chancellor's Research Initiative, and further grown by the Governor's University Research Initiative, which together added tens of millions of dollars in funding for our research. Now, I'm going to spare you today the litany of college rankings that presidents at campuses throughout the country uh, can regurgitate on demand and instead say, while well, there's ample room to grow, we clearly are owning our seat at the national table in terms of academic excellence, affordability, access, postgraduate success, and impact, as reflected in all these rankings. Texas A&M is third among universities with the most CEOs in the Fortune 500. Making the joke ring true, what do you call an Aggie five years after graduation? Boss. Boss. And also, the rankings that put us in the very top of handful of universities recognized for their impact in research, their access and affordability, and their service to the nation. We should be justly proud, and you should be justly proud of this great university you have created. Now, I'm the 25th president of this wonderful university. I've been here for nearly 18 months. That's long enough, I think, to get past the glorious time when you can cl still claim to be the new kid on the block. Now, in fact, that period of time ended officially somewhere between my announcement as president, which got a whopping 2,100 likes on Facebook, <laughs> And four weeks later, the announcement of Reveille 9, which got 17,000 <laughs> likes. So it gave me important perspective as I began my job here. But the newness in the role, a distinct memory, I'm now thrilled to speak today with you about three strategic imperatives 
that revolve around collaboration. Collaboration not just for the sake of it, but collaboration to make the world a better place. The first strategic imperative I want to talk about today is transformational learning. We want 100% of our students to have multiple transformative learning experiences during their time here at Texas A&M. Think for a moment about your own life, about a teacher who took the time to help you learn and hone your skills, about a teacher who gave you an entirely new perspective on your own capabilities, your own capacity for success, about an experience you had in another culture that changed you, or work in a lab or a research project that netted results that may have surprised you and your professor alike. Or perhaps a time when you failed and learned. Defining moments, people, educational experiences, periods of your life when your mind opened to a whole new paradigm in how you frame life and what you can do to contribute to it. I'd like to share one such personal experience of my own. In 2003, Chief Justice William Rehnquist bestowed upon me what I consider one of the great honors of my life and certainly one of the most interesting experiences. He appointed me to serve on the National Commission commemorating the 50th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education. Now, as you recall that 1954 landmark case, it overruled Plessy versus Ferguson which had held that separate is equal. And instead, Brown versus the Board of Education held that we are all inherently equal and that separate is itself inherently inequitable. Serving on that commission was a transformative experience for me. Perhaps most impactful was the opportunity I had to sit down and hear personal accounts from the people who were intimately involved in the case most notably the children of the parents who brought about this historic case. Now adults, they shared their very personal experiences and perspectives as they were living through this extraordinary time, describing their parents' resoluteness in bringing this case, knowing full well all that they were putting at risk, losing their jobs, jeopardizing their livelihoods, being ostracized from their communities, subjecting themselves to physical violence and even death. I asked these courageous individuals why they thought their parents were willing to put everything on the line, even their physical safety. Their response was simple. It was the only way to break the cycle of segregation. They said children to be equal in America, education is and always will be the key. And their parents understood that with utter clarity and they embraced the ideal of education as the great equalizer. Education was and still is the key, and it always will be. It was an extraordinary moment for me. The exactitude of what they fought for underscored for me the importance of education and its centrality to realizing the American dream, how access to public education is not merely a practical necessity, but it's a moral imperative. The experience ignited in me a passion and an appreciation for public education I had never felt before, and the rest of my career has been in public education. It was a transformational learning experience, life-altering. And I believe we have a moral imperative to offer our students not only coursework, but also transformational, high-impact learning experiences. Now, many of you are familiar with transformational learning theory. Essentially, transformational learning theory has three dimensions. First, psychological, changes in understanding of the self. Second, convictional, which is clarifying and honing one's belief system. And third, behavioral, changes in lifestyle and what you do with your life. The result is a new perspective of one's place in the world and what one can contribute to the world. Now we have a distinct advantage here at A&M already, an ethos that traces its roots to our founding as a land-grant institution. We are a people connected to the land, literally grounded, who have always sought and seek today to serve others. 
In fact, no university with which I've ever been affiliated in my career reaches the heights of the spirit of dedication and service like this university. And let me repeat that. No university that I've ever been associated with or had the opportunity to affiliate with in any way does what this university does in terms of its commitment and its passion for service. Now what more can we accomplish when we focus on fostering these transformational high impact learning experiences for our students? And also in the training and educational development opportunities made available to our professors, our administrators, our staff. So I invite you all today to foster an increased number of transformational learning experiences in your own workspaces. For example, that might mean that professors, when onboarding new faculty, help educate them about all the resources we have. It might be new and imaginative, innovative ways of giving students an opportunity to think through and develop their own conceptual capacity. Transformational learning means reaching across departments and colleges within one's discipline and outside to learn and contribute to the success of others. For all students at Texas A&M, not just the top echelon, that means helping them graduate with multiple transformational experiences during their time here. A bold goal, for example, might be that 100% of our students have at least one international experience during their time here. Not just a fun trip, but an experience of impact for greater study or internships. The result will change the lives of our students and those with whom they work. The best way to broaden their perspective on global humanity. We have here already the Pedagogy Project. That's a campus-wide initiative with faculty that you should be hearing more about to help students increase engagement and success in entry-level classes. The goal is to help professors develop learning strategies and approaches that genuinely enhance students' intellectual capabilities, as well as develop skills and learning patterns that enhance their capacity to truly learn during their time here at A&M and throughout the rest of their lives. It is a measurable endeavor as well, through class evaluations, grades in entry-level classes, and success in follow-on courses. Other transformational experiences include high-impact projects, programs such as transformational learning fellows and undergraduate research fellowships. The heart of transformational learning is to enable students to create their own understanding of the world based on facts, based on real data, and organize that understanding in ways that allow them to effectively address real problems in the spaces where they work and where they live. Another example of transformational learning is InMed. InMed, short for Engineering and Medicine, is an innovative curriculum that teaches physicians to also be engineers. The coursework combines the practice of medicine with new technology, innovative training and problem-solving skills to enhance the quality and delivery of health care throughout the United States. This is a bold opportunity about which I am very excited. So expect to hear more from me, uh, as well as from our colleges of engineering and medicine and our partner, Houston Methodist Hospital. But transformational learning isn't limited to professors. It extends to the extraordinary work being done by others around campus, including our wonderful Office of Student Affairs, whose leadership training programs and diversity and inclusion training programs and individual attention to students help make better leaders. And let us not forget the student-to-student -student mentoring that takes place every day, everywhere. It's self-transformative. Now, in the spirit of hastening momentum on this call to action to grow our transformational, high-impact learning opportunities, I'm announcing $2 million this year devoted to grants for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary programs that can impact our students in transformative ways. There'll be more to come uh, on this in follow-on communications from me and the provost in the coming weeks. But again, that's $2 million. So please open your imagination, your creativity, your ingenuity, and your student focus to help us achieve this strategic imperative. Transformational learning, the first in our three strategic imperatives in our continual pursuit of excellence. Let me now turn to the second. 
The second area of focus, or strategic imperative, is discovery and innovation. I think a lot about the idea of discovery and innovation. How are we effectively utilizing the more than $866 million entrusted to us in the last year? What barriers are in place that need to be removed to unlock the greatest potential in all of us? How are we optimizing not just our processes, but our imagination as well? Albert Einstein, in all of his academic prowess, never lost sight of this, never lost sight of the sense of wonder. He once said, the process of discovery is, in effect, a continual flight of wonder. Let us not forget in the busyness of our schedules, our task lists, our to-do lists, to step back, use our imaginations to heighten opportunities for discovery and innovation. Now, as I've spent time with the faculty, staff, and students throughout the university, I genuinely marvel at the extraordinary research, discovery, and innovation already here. And while I could recount examples of these for days, in the interest of time, let me offer just a few. Let me talk for a moment about environmental resilience. That presents abundant opportunities for discovery and innovation, from urban ecology to land use and planning, risk mitigation, to community resilience from hazards, Texas A&M University already has tremendous skill sets that contribute great value to the world in this regard. To those of you from our Galveston campus who are joining us by live stream today, I commend you on the work that you do in environmental resilience, including the Institute for Sustainable Coastal Communities, a joint initiative between the College of Architecture and our Galveston campus that looks at macro problems of increasing population growth and development in these coastal areas. Areas that impact the ecological systems and the human communities and which in turn are themselves impacted by climate variations and other environmental developments. I also applaud the work going on in our School of Public Health looking at disaster relief with respect to coastal communities. Did you know that 50% of the world's population lives within 100 miles of a coastline? A fact which in and of itself necessitates an integrated coastal management approach. Our scientists are thought leaders on this and so much more. One Tree Reef, that's a part of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia, is the world's largest coral reef system. Our Department of Oceanography is working with partners around the world to reverse the effects of carbon dioxide by increasing the alkalinity in the water and restoring chemical balance for these fragile coral reefs and the marine life in them. And they discover even more as they enhance the balance and restoration of these critical, critical environments. Another area is entrepreneurship, where discovery and innovation are in full swing at A&M. Division of the Mays Business School the Center for New Ventures and Entrepreneurship is joined by the Colleges of Liberal Arts, Architecture, and Engineering to develop expertise and differentiation in entrepreneurship. Through a combination of tailored curricula and experiential opportunities, the Center offers a range of programs that help students innovate, opening doors to a wide array of collaboration that lasts well beyond one's academic experience, and into the great next idea put to work. Another area, data science. Vital example of discovery and innovation in action that affects every college and department of this university. Information across the globe, as you well know, is increasingly digitized like never before. That can allow us to do an enormous array of things. For example, enhance healthcare by cross-referencing medical profiles with treatments drugs, interactions, and statistics for so-called precision medicine, as well as more personalized medical treatment. Collaboration is enhanced between data scientists and medical researchers, allowing comparisons of huge data sets to extrapolate valuable information and put it to use. We'll be working towards the creation of the Institute for Data Science to leverage the great work we do across the disciplines and to offer as a resource to find solutions to millions of complex, 
global problems. Now, what's instructive to me as I recite these examples, and I could recite many, many more, is the degree to which the work is significantly enhanced, accelerated, and in fact, in many cases, made possible by collaboration between professors and students from a multitude of disciplines and colleges. I believe our capacity to do this kind of multidisciplinary and collaborative work is a great and in, any way, in many ways unique strength of this university. It really is an extraordinary strength that we have because of the strength of so many departments and when those work together to accomplish things that are barely imaginable. Now, we have not optimized this great strength and opportunity. While we've had extraordinary success stories where resources have been adequately deployed and opportunities for collaboration optimized, we clearly have more work to do to make this easier and more feasible throughout the university. We need to fully address structural barriers, funding streams, evaluative criteria for faculty, and systematic administrative approaches to assist this collaboration. Until we do that, we'll continue to have great one-off successes, but we will limit our ability to take full advantage of this great strength, and we will slow our progress and pathway to excellence. To that end, I've established working groups. One bears the optimistic name of raising the bar to help us address these issues and change both our structure and our culture to make the exceptional routine to allow those professors who wish to collaborate to do so much more easily and seamlessly. This group will examine how we better design budgets and funding streams, as well as space allocations and curricula requirements to make it easier for professors and students to work and collaborate across myriad disciplinary boundaries. Of course, we also want to provide as much support as possible for all our professors including those whose work is largely in a single discipline. That's absolutely critical as well. But our unique opportunity at this point in time is to enhance support for the kind of great interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, collaborative work that happens here, but happens frequently despite, not because, of institutional support in our academic culture. We have two additional groups looking at areas of collaboration around the theme of teaching and research about innovation. Innovation being one of those exceptionally important skills and mindsets we want to impart to our students and infuse in our research. The first group, largely comprised of faculty, is focusing on what they want to do. What precisely is innovation? How do we understand it? How do we teach it? What would research in this space look like? And how can we foster and support it? We've urged them to think expansively and creatively without considering administrative and other possible constraints. The second group is looking at how our administration and our talented staff can contribute positively to this process. One might say the faculty are determining what it is they want to do, and the administrative group is determining how to make it possible, indeed how to make it easy. I've asked these groups to report out their findings by November 1st. Now, others around campus can help, and we warmly urge you to do so. In fact, we've set up an email, not an email to nowhere, but one that will actually come to my attention, for your concrete recommendations on enhancing discovery and innovation. Discovery and innovation that includes research, to be sure, but also more across disciplines, departments, as well as administrative and staff functions, such as human resources, finance, communication, and everything. Draw from your own experiences, from those of your colleagues, both colleagues here and at other institutions where you think they're actually getting it right, and help us continue on our path to excellence. That email is raising the bar, take notes here, raising the bar at tamu.edu, one word, raising the bar, I'll be checking it later this week and noticing who sends me something and who doesn't. <laughs> now, a few preliminary thoughts on how we can better facilitate collaboration at the university level. First, we will continue to focus and cre on creating and enhancing strong disciplines, 
making sure our faculty have as much as we possibly can the resources to compete at the very forefront of their disciplines. To do this, I'm also asking every unit at the university by December 1st to tell me how they are doing this now and what they need to do in order to do it better. Then we will work with those units to help as many as we can actually do it better. A novel idea at a university, I get that, but that's what we're going to do. Second, we will strengthen a multidisciplinary approach where it makes sense by using our great intellectual leaders as well as invited leaders from other institutions to facilitate working group dialogues centered around a variety of specially selected core themes. We'll identify a cadre of what we might call master facilitators to assist with these dialogue groups with an intent that every department head and as much as a third of our faculty will have participated in one of these dialogues by the end of 2017. All to an end of designing and discovering where else we can make a difference in this regard. And third, we will develop criteria and goals so bold ideas can actually break out of these traditional silos and facilitate that happening. We believe these efforts will culminate in at least three approaches, among many others. Two of these approaches are obvious and we have experience. The third's a bit novel, but potentially useful. First, the creation of centers and programs that cross some college boundaries. We're good at this, but we need to make it easier and more rewarding. Second, we create institutes that include many colleges and large numbers of faculty and operate with university and college level support. And third, and this is the novel one, the creation of schools that include faculty and students from all colleges and operate as peers with our current colleges as we move the university forward. This third approach isn't something we've done before, but, but we believe it may well make great sense and enable us to significantly enhance our work in this regard. These bold goals intended to unlock more discovery and innovation along the way. But as bold as they are, they're just the beginning. I look forward to your ideas and your vision to move us even more aggressively and successfully in this direction. Third, as we build upon our strategic imperatives of transformational high impact learning and discovery and innovation, there are results. And the results are impact. Impact is the result of these jobs well done. Impact upon the state of Texas, the citizens of which invest in our very ability to be here, impact upon the nation, impact upon the world. We have such an impact in a multitude of ways. We launch into the world highly trained students like Cole with a passion and an ability to make the world a better place. We conduct research that changes the course of people's lives, of their communities, of the world. We discover, we innovate, and we project that innovation into the world to great effect. And central to who we are is service. We, our faculty, our staff, our students, serve even as we learn and discover. The sheer size of impact we have is enormous. I want to consider some areas where we are impacting our state. These are examples to help spur our thinking for additional great ideas that can be put into action. And they are only a handful of what I see every day. Take, for example, the Center for Urban School Partnerships. This is through the College of Education and is helping K through 12 schools improve standards, teacher and student retention through training materials, on-call support, and information that helps teachers in urban areas close the gap in performance between their schools and their suburban counterparts. The Veterinary Medical Emergency Team combines first responder critical care and support to people and animals during natural disasters. You've undoubtedly seen their impact over the course of the last few years and the disasters we've had here in the state of Texas. The Colonius Project with the Department of Architecture supports border communities in need. The College of Dentistry, that college is itself located in a hub zone. It trains dentists, some of whom are from underserved areas, 
and enables them to return to those underserved areas upon graduation. Now, as part of the training, that college also conducts more than 100,000 patient visits a year for their community. The College of Nursing is a leader in disaster preparedness and response through simulations such as Disaster Day, which offers an interdisciplinary learning experience for medical, nursing, pharmacy, radiology, EMS, and physical therapy students and their community counterparts to be prepared for whenever and whatever they are needed for. The School of Law has implemented a record number of clinics to give third-year students transformational learning experiences while serving clients under the supervision of professors and attorneys. These include entrepreneurship, intellectual property, patent and trademark counsel, international ca cases to serve state businesses and citizens, and to help students who graduate make an immediate impact from the very start on the organization for which they will then work. On the national and global levels, we're seeing tremendous impact in disease mitigation and eradication through preeminent research, the development of mitigation protocols, and treatments of epidemics such as the pervasive Zika virus. Food and water access and stability research and technology. To the College of Geosciences, for example, is making strides in South and Southeast Asia as we better understand and lessen industrial contaminants as well as naturally occurring arsenic in the water. The Nuclear Security Science and Policy Institute, it's a multidisciplinary organization that spans the colleges of engineering, science, and the Bush School of Government to help safeguard nuclear materials and reduce nuclear threats. Tremendous examples of real value and global impact. Now, I apologize to the hundreds of you whose projects have not been mentioned. I'm simply amazed by the work I see daily and the meaningful impact it has on others. Time permits me to mention only a few, but I recognize and applaud the hundreds of other ways we are making a difference throughout the world. And I warmly encourage you to seek opportunities to make that difference. What we do matters. It is of consequence. We are a unique institution and we make a difference. So I want to close now with just a few last thoughts. But as I do that, I want to depart my prepared remarks for a moment and take this opportunity to thank someone very special at this university. As many of you know, uh, Dr. Watson found the pictures that I have been keeping of her <laughs> and has announced that she will be stepping down as provost at the end of this, end of this academic year. Karen has served in an enormous range of capacities in this university and made a difference. Uh, she has kept the candle burning on academic excellence. She's steadied the ship academically, even in somewhat tumultuous times. This university, every professor, every member of this staff, and the 500,000 Aggie network owe her a greater thanks. Would you please join me in thanking Karen for her time? <laughs> I couldn't let that moment pass, but we're not giving her the microphone. <laughs> In closing, I want to thank you, faculty, staff, administrators, students. Thank you also to the affiliate organizations who help raise an extraordinary amount of funds for us to do what we do. For those organizations that help build awareness among those who are not familiar with us, and affinity among those who do across the 500,000 member Aggie network. A network whose support and assistance is absolutely essential to our great work. To be a leading university going into the future, we have to lead. We have to lead in the area of both scholars who are disciplinary thought leaders and scholars who can do great work in teams of colleagues from many disciplines. 
This university, this university must strengthen our culture so that these simultaneous acts can be inhibited only by our own ability to find the most creative approach and not by administrative barriers and not by lack of support. So please join me in building out the areas of best practice we talked about across these strategic imperatives. Transformational learning, discovery and innovation, and impact. Collaborate with colleagues inside and outside of your departments, colleges, and schools to continue to drive towards excellence in all that we do. And in closing, I pledge to you today to work collaboratively towards impact. And I'm asking you again on this quasi-quicentennial anniversary <laughs> of the birth of this great university to join me in creating a stronger, more creative capacity for collaboration and transformative learning and discovery. For 140 years, we, while we have done this at the university, and what we have done matters, that provides a unique foundation for us to move into the future. It's us, up to us to build on that foundation, and I hope you sense my belief. It is not only an extraordinary opportunity, it is an obligation on us to do that, to prepare our students to create new possibilities, to prepare and create and enable our students to create their world going forward, as we have done for 140 years in the past. Thank you very much for being with us today.